So let's get underway. We uh, we have a uh, pretty interesting timing uh, once again. Uh, I think last time we had a webinar, or I held a webinar mostly. Uh, it was very even more interesting timing because we were right at the bottom or or top, if you will, of the of the market's uh, a panicky move. Bottom in terms of risky assets, top in terms of the panic levels, and one could ask whether now we're at the top of the the bounce back from those uh, panicky levels we had to to begin the year. So I'm calling this 2016 year of the whiplash year of whiplash question mark because it certainly seems like uh, we can't decide what we're what's uh, what's coming next, and the market I think is uh, revealing how unsecure it is about the future. Uh, brief, uh, but please do read our disclaimer. And nothing I say should be held accountable to for uh, any claims of performance and so on. We're just uh, looking at what we think is going to happen. Um, I will do a brief note, one brief note. Uh, we have a, a, an upcoming webinar. You see the link there in the chat. Uh, our, my colleague Ola will be looking at uh, uh, will be looking at giving a webinar on commodities. So uh, please do sign up for that if it's an area that interests you. Uh, and I'm going to take you through the outlook there. So again. <clears throat> What am I going to cover today? And actually, a brief uh, point of order. Please do, if you have any general questions on anything I'm saying throughout, or, or if you come into the webinar with a, with a question or two in, in mind, feel free to type those in the chat. Um, I'm not, I won't be sure to get to those as I'm presenting, but uh, of course, uh, it'd be nice to have maybe a couple of questions queued up uh, when I do finish, because I, I am dedicating some time to uh, essentially as many questions as come up uh, from you all. Uh, during and after my, I've run through uh, some of the slides here. So kick things off, yes, what a turnaround we've had uh, here since the beginning of the year. We had, of course, we started the uh, on a very rough note um, and sold off quite heavily uh, all of the uh, various issues, oil price uh, concerns, uh, risky assets, uh, all selling off on, on that, on Chinese uh, revaluation concerns. Um, and the idea that central banks are losing their, their mojo, if you will, and we were towards the bottom of that move uh, the last time we presented. Now we've seen quite a, quite a turnaround, quite a rally in risk appetite. Uh, essentially, every if you look at almost every factor that was concerning the market back then, I think a lot of them are interlocking and, and, and related. They've all, they've all yielded to uh, or eased. All these concerns have eased, especially, again, the strong dollar, the Chinese revaluation worries, and, and the oil price. Uh, worries, commodities collapsing, etc. A lot of this was feeding into emerging market concerns, which all bounced on these as well, especially I think the pressure coming off the dollar and on the Fed rate outlook has helped emerging markets and emerging market currencies rebounding. On the Chinese currency front, we've had a, a certainly a frustrated outlook for those looking to buy into a Chinese devaluation. We have seen actually the Chinese currency quite weak, but it's weak against other currencies, uh, emerging market currencies, uh, other Asian currencies. And not so much versus the dollar, where it's gone pretty much flat to even slightly higher uh, in recent trade. It's quite clear that China wants to punish anybody trying to speculate against their currency, even if longer-term fundamentals still point to a, an extreme need to devalue. But for now, they're trying to hold the line, and that's still an open question mark whether they'll be able to. So, what is the uh, what is the focus from here? Well, we have. Uh, we have a focus on whether this is a false dawn or is this the real thing. And uh, on that front, it's actually quite interesting timing-wise as well that we have uh, the S&P crossing just above the 200-day moving average and a key uh, Fibonacci retracement level as well. This is our global risk benchmark. So I think this is about uh, whether, we, uh, uh, whether we are indeed fully coming back on board or if this is a, a simply a throwback rally and we get back to the, the concerns that were dogging the markets. At the beginning of the year, I think those concerns are still very much in evidence. Uh, the question is uh, whether we've able to have bought some time and, and the delay here, or we can immediately lurch back into into risk aversion. I think there's some chance, especially with what the ECB has done, that uh, market hopes are kept up for at least uh, the short term. Another question is uh, suddenly after we, we wiped out all of the Fed anticipation at the beginning of the year because of all these concerns, now we've priced about half of it back in. So we have only a 4% chance that tomorrow's FOMC meeting uh, uh, sorry, it's a Wednesday's FOMC meeting, the 4% chance of rate hike according to the market. We have priced back in more than 50-50 odds of a move uh, uh, at the June meeting. Uh, and that 50-50 odds was actually shoved out into 2017 as recently as a few weeks ago. Uh, I think actually all of the, the conditions are there for the Fed to go ahead and hike it this month, uh, except for maybe some of the activity surveys. It's just they don't want to they don't want to change directions too quickly. Uh, but I think the market may be a little bit underestimating the potential for uh, a bit more hawkish language from the Fed. 
Mark seems quite confident that it's it's a bill, it's it can uh, look past that, however, and that the Fed uh, Fed hawkishness is not a threat. I still think it's uh, out there as a threat if conditions do continue to improve, because they're going to find that they're way behind the curve if we do have, especially earnings payrolls and CPI continuing to point higher. Not a concern for now, possibly a concern medium term. Uh, central bank policy signals, another focus, of course, after the ECB, and I have a euro dollar chart here for good reason. That is back in December, of course, we saw this enormous earthquake of reaction and uh, what was perceived as the ECB overpromising. So we had the Europe, the euro collapsing almost into the meeting, overpromising and under delivering very little, uh, very little in the way of uh, new measures, uh, merely an extension of the program and, and very uh, weak uh, cut of the deposit facility rate. It triggered an avalanche of short covering, and we went quiet for two months before that was followed up higher. This time around, there was a sense that ECB was going to get serious, so the euro was falling, but the, the ECB was careful not to uh, over-announce, and yet it did surprise in a very big way. Euro dollars started to sell off, the euro started to sell broadly, and then we had another avalanche in the opposite direction, short covering, and we'll get to the reasons behind that. But it, it, one, one general takeaway, and if you look at the Bank of Japan reaction, in January, when they tried to move into negative rates to impress uh, people into selling the currency, it, it very much backfired. Um, is whether the current set of central bank policy choices is simply not getting traction in the market. I think it's par that's part of the reason here. Uh, as well, uh, I think we should all be looking at uh, the U.S. political cycle. I think it could be an increasing concern if it becomes clear that Mr. Trump is the Republican nominee. So, uh, of course, the most recent big event in the market was this ECB meeting uh, reaction and decision. What was that all about? I think a couple of things. Uh, the point at which the euro started to actually uh, squeeze higher and uh, and rally was at the point during the uh, Q&A in the press conference when uh, President Draghi indicated that this is essentially the end of the line for negative rate cuts because of the risks uh, to banks uh, from continuing to do so. That idea, this is it, this is all we've got on the rate side of things, sort of suggests that Draghi is admitting defeat, if you will, in the global currency war, um, uh, if, if we're supposed to be trading on the global currency war theme, uh, but certainly was seen as euro supportive because it, it stops the interest rates from going lower. I think the other point, and which was more euro supportive, uh, it was this focus on the credit easing with these new uh, quantitative easing measures, uh, buying of corporate bonds, but especially the big TLTROs, which are going to have very easy lending terms to banks where they can lend it even at negative rates down to the deposit facility rate. Uh, and I think this whole bank issue was, was, one, of the key, uh, was one of the key issues that had the, the uh, European financial conditions under pressure recently and the so sovereign spreads pushing out wider, which we see here in this chart where we have uh, in yellow uh, Portuguese spreads to 10-year uh, spreads to the German 10-year rate, in green the Spanish, and in white the uh, Italian 10-year yield relative to Germany. Those are all pushing wider. There were some other uh, regulatory uh, issues uh, that were at the center of this about how banks would be resolved if there was they got into a, a, uh, if they were uh, coming under pressure. But those have all been crushed back lower. So on that measure, this has been a forceful, successful measure by the ECB, even if they didn't get what they likely wanted, which was a weaker currency. Uh, but still, on the on the currency front, we are seeing market, we are seeing some of these moves, especially by the bigger central banks, to get traction in the market, not succeeding as, as has been the case in the past. And as well, of course, one of the key issues that was uh, driving the markets and market concerns, and why we've seen a big bounce back in risk appetite, is that the Chinese currency, at least relative to the dollar, has gone absolutely nowhere. Uh, we have seen a, a quite a considerable, this is versus the uh, Japanese yen, that the Chinese currency is, has a um, uh, Japanese currencies are pretty quite a, appreciated quite a bit, so this is weakening versus the yen. This is weakening versus the euro, the, the Chinese currency. And even against uh, Asian peers, it finally managed to, to get a little bit weaker versus these uh, emerging, mar emerging Asia or, or developed Asia uh, currencies in this last leg of action, even as the dollar, uh, Chinese versus the dollar um, a trade has, has flattened out. But from here, again, a lot of these concerns that we came into the year with have gone absolutely nowhere. They've simply been put on hold. And I think China is effectively simply pressing the delay button. I think there we should still be as just as concerned as before with China, uh, especially when they're doing things like at their National uh, People's Congress, 
reaffirming the growth targets of six and a half to seven percent entirely inappropriate for where the economy is where they need to be focusing on uh, healing their uh, debt situation in the credit bubble uh, they're not doing so I think that's uh, actually raises the level of concern in the longer term uh, as well the huge credit expansion is is there and it's it maybe creating new pressures on the currency to devalue or even seeing signs that we're feeding a new housing bubble in tier one cities on top of what was already a world beating bubble if you will and again the debt problem hasn't gone anywhere the size of the bank balance sheets at a couple hundred plus percent of Chinese GDP the risks when non-performing loans start to, to pick up from this if you have a standard non-performing loan cycle like any banking system would have in a credit bubble you have uh, a very large percentage of, of GDP under under pressure and in the size of a 10% NPL problem, as uh, Kyle Bass, among others, has pointed out, would uh, effectively be larger than the entirety of, of China's FX reserves. As well, these FX reserves have been drawn down to defend the Chinese currency, and they may be far smaller than is indicated because of the way these are calculated and not including certain uh, categories uh, or over including some categories because they're not uh, uh, attributed to other uh, to other uh, places like the development banks they've uh, developed so in other words what is the liquidity of this number and how much is it able to, to be used to defend the currency um, basically the Chinese situation has gone nowhere they're still affected by the so-called trilemma um, and going on further the other concerns we've mentioned corporate uh, the corporate um, uh, bonds in the US especially in the energy sector rising risk of uh, eventual uh, default if we look at share of companies that are losing money the default rate hasn't really picked up normal cycles will see the default rate picking up as uh, as companies start to lose money and it would only take uh, with uh, bigger liquidity problems that would only take one major uh, default to trigger to trigger something uh, and interesting uh, less less sort of pessimistic and more on the interesting side of what was driving a stronger dollar in the first place was is of course the uh, rise in US uh, inflation and uh, the job market has still done quite well. There have been a couple of uh, worrisome points in, in activity surveys and so on, but if you look at the other indicators, the two that we're supposed to be looking on, the, according to the Fed's dual mandate, is uh, uh, of course CPI, the inflation, and uh, the jobs market, both of which are quite strong. If you look at the core CPI in the U.S. here in white, we're actually already well above 2%, uh, and this could be picking up further, or is it just these uh, these uh, some of these silly drivers that, that that are driving the CPI higher the owners equivalent rent is one of these and uh, some of the Obamacare related the medical costs etc but you still see some directional confirmation in the PCE core index which is uh, risen to local highs as well as the headline which uh, is increasingly going to be uh, coming up it's going to take some time uh, because of course the, the oil price uh, comparisons are still somewhat favorable, especially in the spring here. When, uh, if we look at the last May, we still had crude oil around sixty dollars a barrel. So, having fallen as low as thirty and below, uh, it's going to take a bit of time to get all of the energy effects, uh, commodity effects, uh, uh, sort of evened out or flattened out for the year-on-year compar year comparisons. Uh, next CPI data point, by the way, is on uh, Wednesday, the same day this week, the same day as the FOMC. It'll be interesting if this continues to push higher. If uh, the, to what degree the Fed notches up the concern level. Uh, this is a slide I've included in almost every presentation I've, I've given in, in, uh, uh, over the last uh, year or two, and that is the whole question. The question uh, that it still has yet to be answered is, is can, can a central bank exit a QE program without running into the so-called QE trap? Uh, and that is because when you do QE, when you're printing money to buy assets, it makes asset bubbles. Eventually those pop and you get deflation. That's, that's I think, a cycle with we're all concerned about and we see how the Fed reacts to uh, financial uh, uh, risky assets for selling off and the deflation concerns have never gone anywhere despite all the money printing now that that previous slide would seem to suggest that maybe we're finally getting out of this dynamic but I think bigger picture longer term it's still an open question of can you exit a QE cycle uh, and if, if you can't do it through QE, well, what do you need to do? Well, I think it has to be a focus on, on fiscal stimulus if, if they really want demand in the economy and inflation. So <clears throat> bottom lines, uh, after that very rapid run through of, of a number of themes, um, and if, if you can't hear it uh, already, I'll, I'll try to make it get explicit. The 
outlook, I think, for the dollar is that the bull market will return. I think the timing is very difficult to discern on that. I think near term there's some risk of lower levels. Uh, if the Fed remains quiet for a while, we have uh, European risk assets picking up because of hopes uh, from, from these latest uh, ECB measures. The old policy divergence story is not really firing. The QE story is not firing in terms of getting currencies to weaken because a, a central bank is doing QE. Look at Japan where the yen is still relatively strong despite their radical uh, uh, expansion and despite having dipped into negative interest rate policy. Markets are a bit of a loss, so what to do as well. So I think it, it's very, the very near-term outlook next m month to three months is very, is very difficult. But I do long-term expect for the dollar bull market to return, whether we're in a crisis or whether we're in a, a strong global recovery. Euro, uh, somewhat for the same reasons. Um, I, I still believe in euro dollar to parity and possibly beyond. Uh, if we are going into a new crisis, which I'm not saying we are, but if we are going into a new situation, uh, Europe is far worse positioned, much poor, more poorly positioned than the U.S., for example, the banking system, exposure to emerging markets, etc., all of the difficulties of the EU framework. Um, near term, maybe we're headed a little bit higher, but again, I think pressure will get on the, uh, will, will come back in on the euro. Uh, the Japanese yen, I think what we've seen lately is, and we actually uh, flagged this uh, ahead of the, the start of the year, that we're looking for a stronger yen for at least some of the year. We've seen that to, to quite a, a degree. Uh, but a lot of this is simply the unwinding of the uh, what was actually an absolutely incredible move to the downside, some rebalancing, a mean reversion, and I think the the inability of the Bank of Japan to engineer a weaker currency despite new measures spooked the market a bit. Maybe got some speculators out as well as got hedgers back in, worried that it could go stronger still ahead of the, the new financial year in Japan. But let's remember, let's in the big longer term picture, let's remember what the end game is for the Bank of Japan and the, the terrible. A situation with the Japanese debt levels and what it's planning to do with Japanese debt, which is essentially to monetize in the longer uh, longer run. So there may be further short-term potential for yen strength, but eventually it's it's headed weaker. Uh, sterling, it clearly the market overplayed its hand uh, recently in, in selling sterling, especially versus the dollar. Uh, maybe Brexit worries are overplayed, maybe they're not. It's, it's interesting, there it seems to be a domestic split in the UK. Uh, in the UK, they're far more concerned about the likelihood of a Brexit, even if the polls suggest that it's, uh, the, the vote to, to, to stay in the EU is, is uh, stronger. Internationally, it's considered overwhelmingly likely that they stay in the EU. So it's, uh, I, I think we're on a, in a holding pattern for now. Um, and uh, But the interesting thing is, even if we're not to worry about Brexit, there are other worries uh, to, be, uh, to, to be concerned uh, on the, with the UK on the current account deficits. Uh, the, the, Massive structural terms of trade problem with the UK has, has never gone away, and uh, if we're in a more optimistic situation, Sterling can kind of uh, ignore this as it attracts capital flows. But if uh, if we're in a new uh, global weakness paradigm, I think Sterling is especially uh, vulnerable on that account, far more vulnerable than any of the other major currencies. For the smaller uh, developed uh, market currencies, the commodity dollars. Um, They've gotten some much needed relief recently, and I think uh, this relief could continue for a while. Um, but I would suggest that we're at least 50, 60%, and maybe 75% through any, uh, any resilience uh, that they may see. Uh, again, I don't see a, a huge commodity boom uh, coming so fast on the heels of the last super, super bubble or super boom as well. These, these economies have come up sorely imbalanced from uh, excessively low rates relative uh, uh, to uh, what the policy rate should have been, and that was done in, the order, in order to avoid excessive currency strength. So you've had uh, tremendous housing bubbles develop in these smaller economies, uh, and these will serve as a headwind on the economies for, for some time to come. So of the three, Kiwi the weakest, uh, Aussie maybe next, and CAD is the, is the least uh, weak of the three. And emerging markets, the challenge is on hold. A lot of the relief has come about because of the uh, uh, the dollar, the easing of the dollar strength, uh, and the easing of concerns on China, and maybe investors excessively uh, positioned for uh, a meltdown. I think we've we sort of rebalanced the books on that. Again, similar to the to, to the other comments, I think uh, uh, it's too early to to declare the all clear. Um, and I suspect these problems could return if we do see a return of dollar strength, and especially, of course, Fed uh, rate hikes uh, if the Fed is behind the curve. 
So what is key from here? Obviously, the status in the global recovery and the U.S. recovery. Uh, is the Fed behind the curve, or is the Fed going to have to give up and, and head back into QE? Um, and how does it treat the inflection point of, of the one regime versus the other? As well as central banks, I think we're, we're largely done in terms of the QA, of QE getting traction. Uh, negative interest rates are seen as a failure, and any attempt to pursue them is seen as very negative for any any central bank that, that does so. Uh, so negative for risk appetite when you're doing negative interest rate to, uh, f for going further into negative interest rate territory, and a shoulder shrug if you're expanding or contracting your QE. The, the market just doesn't care as much. These policies only work when you believe they work. And what does that mean? It means that only some new policy can have traction. What is new policy? It's about fiscal uh, fiscal stimulus, so-called helicopter money. That's where the future lies for uh, policy to have traction, to get inflation back uh, in gear, etc. So that's the, the longer term outlook there. And again, the whole to me, the whole paradigm here is being unsure of whether we're headed for, you know, revisiting some of the global crisis concerns or, or the crisis concerns uh, centered on China and, and other markets or or not. Whether, regardless, I think the dollar does quite well. The U.S. is positioned better for a crisis and better for a recovery. Um, so I think any any weakness in the dollar is, uh, is going to fade uh, beyond the very uncertain uh, next couple of months. And again, just a very brief, I thought, saw this comment today, I thought I'd pass it along, I think it's very true. Uh, and I think it's worth considering because I think it's all part of the same phenomenon, whether it's uh, the political situation in the U.S. where the, the, the extreme candidates, Trump and Sanders, are getting support, the entire Brexit issue, some of the anti-EU and anti-immigration voices in Europe, I think they're all uh, interesting sides of the same uh, type of energy, which is a dissatisfaction with the establishment and the way things are. And I think we have some very interesting forces at work here. And let's not focus too much, I think, on the person of Trump or Sanders or whoever. It's about people voting to uh, destroy the establishment. And part of that establishment has been created by a very uh, a poor batch of central bank policy making that has created tremendous inequality uh, and has not solved uh, key economic problems in, uh, after the global financial crisis hit. In 2008. <clears throat> now I've uh, actually managed to talk uh, far more than I intended to, uh, but so I will run briefly through the charts. I think a lot of charts are not in a, a very uh, decisive, uh, not in very decisive situations at this point in time. I and mean, look at your dollar; it's in the middle of a range that's been uh, was established uh, over a year ago. And uh, yes, we saw this tremendous recent reversal and rally off the back of the ECB, but it's happening within the shadow of both a, a sell-off and a rally, uh, basically mid-range. I think uh, if we take the December lesson as well, where we saw a, a similar a huge rally, it just faded for two months. This, the next leg of the rally faded immediately. It, it just feels like the market does not know what to do with the, uh, the currency pair. And uh, my initial belief would be that, yes, we could follow through a little bit higher, but unless something new emerges, uh, I would uh, think the market fades any strength and we head back uh, towards lows of the cycle for the reasons I've mentioned. If we do get ambitious to the upside, I would suspect it's because uh, there are concerns about the U.S. recovery. We have a big risk uh, risk aversion move, uh, et cetera. It, you know, maybe we take out 115 and a little bit higher, but that's uh, that's uh, assumes a lot, I think. Dollar yen, I think there's more chance here that, uh, that there's – I mean, we had such a nice setup here with this head and shoulders formation 116. It broke, but there's been no there's been no follow through beyond the initial impulse, which which again it raises the uncertainty levels. Yes, nominally we're in a very bearish setup here. We've broken this key line. We're waiting, but to me, when when you momentum doesn't follow through very quickly, it, it really raises the risks that that uh, that fading momentum just turns back into upside momentum which would be the case if we get the scenario where risk appetite continues to fire strongly and we have the, the idea that the Fed is behind the curve and we see rate hikes uh, uh, needing to be priced back in. Technical trigger for that, though, would be a, a rally back up through 116. And for now, we've got four weeks effectively within a very narrow range. Um, and on the, on the more upside, the upside scenario, that would be with risk off with a Bank of Japan that, that says basically says as well that it can't do any more policy for now. 
um, and more hedging into year end by uh, Japanese corporates, etc. There is a, a big target for both the head and shoulders formation and a, an old Fibonacci uh, from from the entire rally around 106.50, I think, was the focus. But but I think you need to see it at least start to close below 112 to start to indicating any fresh downside momentum. And again, uh, you know, I'm sure technical analysts like to be uh, wishy-washy, but this is a very wishy-washy chart. Uh, near term because we haven't had decent follow through. Cable, another one where the cable, the sterling pessimism extended too far. We got a reversal. I'm not sure we gonna, we're going to get enough uh, good news for, for the UK to, to send it uh, considerably back higher unless there's something particularly negative going on for the dollar. I would suspect we are stuck in some kind of very choppy nervous range below about 145, uh, 146 and between there and 140. Dollar Swiss failed to confirm the upside breaks this year in some kind of a descending channel. Do note the 200-day moving average here shown as the 40-week moving average seems to be very important. It could be possibly as well a, an area where the S&B is looking at uh, uh, stepping in uh, opportunistically together with the uh, Euro Swiss uh, around 109 and, and slightly below. Uh, and to get the chart interesting to the upside, I'd like to see this line of consolidation, which I've not drawn. Uh, if you connect those two dots and then extend out. We need to close the week uh, above parity and take out that line to, to get that upside view going again. And that's, again, going to be on, on uh, the Fed having to catch up uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, more rate hikes being priced in. On Aussie, we've, uh, last time we were around, we did discuss this new low being rejected as a bullish setup. Uh, we were in early in February discussing that. It took a while, but it did, uh, it did fall through higher. Now we're in the in the situation where we're looking for where is the top. Is that top here? Uh, the 618 is an important Fibonacci retracement of this, uh, this sell-off here. If we're pushing through that, it does possibly open up for 80 plus. Uh, however, again, it's, it's me is more about trying to figure out if we're at the very end of the move or close to the end of the move and looking for bearish setups as I'm longer term, less, uh, less interested in Aussie upside and more interested in, in where to sell it again now that we've seen a, a, pretty, a pretty reasonable consolidation. One interesting Aussie trade, though, if you weren't looking to avoid the dollar, I've been showing all the dollar pairs, is, uh, we've discussed this quite a bit in the, in the updates, is the Aussie Kiwi uh, chart. This 113 area is quite interesting. The uh, rate spreads and the potential for the RBNZ to cut is uh, greater than the, Aussie, than the RBA. Uh, and those rate spreads are already suggest that it should be up at perhaps 115 or higher. Uh, and the market's been a bit slow to, to, to to glom onto this story, I'm not sure why, but it's a very interesting level, 113. Um, and we've got a, a break of this descending line of consolidation, or trend line, if you will. And uh, I think I think there's potential here to 115, maybe even 120 uh, in the medium term. Uh, the Kiwi, a longer term basis, a very overvalued. Uh, they're, they're, the, the RBNZ waxed very dovish at its most recent meeting. Um, I think there's just a, a lot more downside potential there, especially if we go back into a, a risk-off uh, uh, market with with liquidity in the Kiwi far inferior to Aussie, although I was surprised how well the Kiwi managed to do uh, during the recent bout, so I'm a little bit less uh, confident that uh, the market uh, uh, punishes Kiwi on that front. It's more about the, the rate spread and longer-term valuation concerns, uh, as well as uh, the, the New Zealand is a bit of a one-trick pony with... Uh, with its focus on uh, the dairy industry. Uh, dollar CAD has been very interesting because of the, the, the spike the, uh, at the, towards the end of the year <clears throat> and into the beginning of the year that was almost parabolic in nature. Somehow, somehow Dollar Canada gets caught in these, uh, uh, in these almost parabolic moves. We saw one of those all the way to 146, and now we've uh, retraced it back all the way to the 200-day moving average. And uh, I'm getting a bit contrarian at these levels, actually, on a potential for further downside. But the next focus points, 130 in this, this uh, key 128.50-ish uh, area uh, is interesting as well. Oh, I think we'll need to see maybe some fresh weakness in, in, in oil markets and for the Fed outlook to pick up to, to start to see uh, some support. Because near term, that's, that's just been a sheer cliff back lower, so we need to see some kind of uh, bullish setup on uh, uh, to suggest that the lows are in for the, for the short term here. And then very briefly on positioning, since I've already uh, jabbered on here for 30 minutes, uh, I think there are two things to note that are very interesting. One, Japanese yen positioning. Uh, there was one week in the history where there's been longer Japanese yen positioning in the U.S. futures market. 
one week only. And uh, that's very interesting. Of course, the levels at 64,000 contracts are smaller than some of the times when the, the market has been selling the Japanese yen, where the positioning has been greater. But uh, just getting a bit contrarian on a positioning front on the Japanese yen strength here. Sterling strength, or sorry, sterling weakness is uh, seeing near record, uh, not near record, but very low, uh, very uh, short positioning in sterling. Euro is more neutral, if still short. And then finally, the other interesting one is the Aussie uh, positioning has been getting quite long uh, uh, in U.S. futures terms at uh, 29,000 contracts, one of the biggest longs out there besides the yen uh, versus the U.S. dollar. So that concludes my uh, uh, a half hour there, and I, I'll be happy again to field any of your questions you have on anything I've said, and I'll have a look here at uh, a couple of things that have uh, come in through the chat uh, as I uh, as I await your questions. The first webinar, um, I'll is, is the one uh, that that was back from early February. Um, I'll see if I can get a link while we're talking here. Otherwise, uh, look for uh, a post on tradingfloor.com where we have. Uh, a, a brief version of this, slightly shortened version of this webinar uh, available. We'll try to post a, a link or two uh, in that post uh, where, where this whole, where you can replay this entire webinar um, once we've uh, packaged it up for you and got it posted out there. So this is not the last chance you'll get to, to hear what I've said and, and view the slides. It'll be available again, uh, again in a post on tradingfloor.com. If the ECB can't get a weaker currency, then how negative will that be for Europe? Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, the revaluation that really needs to happen within Europe is is internally between, let's say, Germany and uh, the periphery. Uh, and because that revaluation can't happen easily, um, because they're all using the same currency, Mr. Draghi has attempted to engineer it by weakening the euro versus the rest of the world. So. Uh, uh, I don't think it really matters uh, that much whether the euro is at 115 or 105. Uh, but if, of course, it starts getting up above uh, above this uh, zone, up towards 120 or more, I think it becomes uh, a negative for the EU periphery in terms of uh, in terms of competitiveness. So um, I think that's a, a marginal negative uh, if if the euro rises much beyond its its uh, range from 2015. Regarding corporate defaults, do you have a breakdown by industry? Uh, that's not my general focus, but yes, the, the energy is uh, is definitely the the focus of where the weak corporates have been, and uh, the more optimistic outlook would be uh, that that if the focus is merely on the energy market, that we can have some defaults and, and it could be isolated to that sector, and doesn't necessarily have to trigger a contagion. The contagion risk actually becomes higher not because uh, two reasons. One is, is uh, liquidity concerns. The, the banks, because of the new regulatory regime in the U.S., are not allowed to warehouse uh, uh, the, the kind of risk that they were able to before 2008, uh, where they could keep a larger inventory of these bonds uh, on their on their balance sheets, or and and uh, absorb a great deal of liquidity. Now that it's sort of left up to the market's own devices. So if you have, for example, a credit event at a, a large a corporate. Uh, if, if people are seeing their uh, statements coming in showing losses, and you have a the market or, or investors dumping their ETFs and their and their, their corporate bond funds, it can become one of these sort of self-fulfilling liquidity uh, problems. I think that's a greater risk from the liquidity side uh, and market infrastructure side or market structure side, rather than the actual fundamentals of how many corporates are going to default uh, or whether the credit situation or the the, the situation and high-risk companies is particularly bad or not for this cycle. Again, it's the market itself that could be the source uh, of the problem. Uh, on dollar-swiss, possible objective at 106. Well, I think if your dollar is going to parity, uh, I think dollar-swiss is going, uh, obviously, much higher. Um, so certainly, uh, I see at uh, 103 a break being key, um, uh, the actual high being a bit above 103. And I think there's a, a very considerable potential above there uh, in the longer run. The problem is with the near-term outlook and uh, whether we've got so much disappointment and, and a further short cycle of dollar weakness uh, that's going to uh, mean we're going to have to sit on our hands for a while to, before we can get any kind of, kind of upside traction in the dollar. 
uh, versus currencies like Swiss, uh, the Euro, uh, the Japanese Yen, uh, etc. I think it's, um, I think again, the near term outlook is, is, is very rough. Uh, and hopefully it will, it'll clear up tomorrow. We've got five central banks left uh, to meet and decide this week. And two of those, the Bank of Japan tonight, market not expecting anything. Do, do uh, realize the potential importance on the, on the Bank of Japan and on the Yen of the, uh, the new financial year. Uh, with the old one ending uh, at the end of March, and uh, the, the potential that, that hedge uh, that hedging activity dries up after uh, uh, after the end of the year, Bank of Japan not likely to do anything. Not sure what the market reaction is there. Um, I would suggest that to some degree not much is expected. So what are you what are you supposed to do with that? I think uh, once we get over to the to the new year, I think uh, yen maybe becomes a more sensitive to risk appetite as it has been in the past. Um, and then what does the FOMC do? Uh, I don't think they hike rates. It's very low odds if they do. It'll be, uh, it'll have an avalanche of uh, reaction to that. Um, and I think they'll signal a small upgrade to their likelihood of, of, of hiking rates. That's already been priced in. So again, that's what that would, I would guess, possibly increases the risk that, uh, that the dollar is, that continues to stumble a bit near term. Uh, and then it's, it's once we get uh, stronger a stronger series of data coming in that uh, we see the uh, the dollar if you pick up. Or, again, if we head into crisis mode again, the dollar comes out on top eventually as well. It's just this sort of in-between um, dollar or U.S. economy so-so, uh, other central banks are doing policy that makes maybe some of the other asset markets look uh, look better temporarily is uh, seems to be the regime of the moment. So if there uh, are not, are there any further questions? If you want, if you'd like to, uh, if somebody's a quick typer, uh, I'll have room for a, a one more. Uh, otherwise, uh, perhaps I'll go ahead and wrap it up here and uh, say thank you, everyone. Everyone, thank you very much for joining, and uh, hope to see you again in the future uh, for further webinars. Do tune into our our webinar page for uh, updates on when the next webinars are coming, including whether it's uh, myself or uh, one of my colleagues at uh, at one of the future webinars. Thanks again for attending, and uh, all the best.